We've produced quite a few videos related to electrical troubleshooting, but they've all been rather segmented. Some have been on electrical fundamentals, some on electrical testing techniques, even a few on reading a schematic. But no time have we put all of those elements together. Well, that's going to change on today's edition of The Trainer. You ready to get started? The vehicle is a 2014 Scion TC, and the concern is that the sunroof will sometimes not open. Now the first word that catches my attention in this concern is the word sometimes. Sometimes could mean that I'm looking for an intermittent problem, but let me clarify something for you. An intermittent problem does not mean something that happens now and then on some mystical whim. It means that it's a problem that will only occur under a very specific set of circumstances. So I'll need to keep that in mind as I perform this diagnosis. Now before I even start on the vehicle, I want to do a little homework first. I want to understand exactly how the sunroof system operates on this vehicle. I also want to take a look at the wiring diagram so I can see what the commonalities and what the unique features are of that system. And for this, I'm going to turn to my service information choice. In this case, the one offered by our sponsor, Mitchell One Pro Demand. Now, when you first open Pro Demand, this is the home screen you'll see. And one of the first things that you'll need to do is build the vehicle that you want information on. And what do I mean by that? If you're a professional technician, you know that even the same model across model years from a given manufacturer can be different from one to the other. In other words, the systems that they have can be different from one model year to the next. Um, they can even be different during the course of a model year. They can make a change mid-model year. And unless you put in good information, you may or may not get the information you need to correctly fix the car. So we're going to go up here to select vehicle, and we have a couple different choices here. If we've already put the vehicle in the system, well, then we have a vehicle history we can go back and look at. Uh, the bottom one I want to talk about, that's vehicle selection. That's simply where we're going to add in uh, year, make, model, answer a couple of other questions about the specific build, but not real detailed. And then we have VIN or plate. Now, I kind of like the VIN idea because it's based directly on the VIN number of the vehicle that I enter. But Mitchell off also offers this plate feature. And that's going to populate the VIN. And it also tells us, okay, we got a 2014 Scion TC, so everything's cool. So we're going to use this vehicle. And that brings us to our OneSearch Plus screen. Now, before I go in to the, the job at hand, I want to talk a little bit about some of the features here in ProDemand that you may or may not be familiar with. The OneSearch Plus is based on farmed information that Mitchell gets from its users. And they've been around a long time. They've been doing this for a long time. There are literally millions of records of uh, repair and, and system lookups that they've collected over the years. And that's what this is based on here. In this case, it's based on over 16,000 repairs related to a 2014 Scion TC. And we get commonly replaced components, common DTCs, common symptoms, and common top search lookups that technicians have actually looked for. And when you review them, you can see that uh, nothing really out of the uh, ordinary, some pretty common stuff. So in my mind, that's showing me basically this is a pretty solid car. Now here, I want to draw, uh, draw your attention to the buttons at the top. This just makes going to commonly used items in a service information system more directly accessible from one place. Of course, you have technical service bulletins, common specs. 
The third one I want to draw your attention to, driver assist ADOS. Now you notice this is not solid for this vehicle because there are no ADOS systems on this vehicle. However, if you are working on a vehicle that has ADOS systems on it, you can use this button to help you find out if the repair you're making is going to affect one of these systems. And then if so, what you'll need to do to correct it. Well, you have to do some type of programming or most commonly a calibration or initialization program. Uh, this will help you get that information. And that's, that's really critical nowadays because a lot of common services that you do are going to impact the ADOS systems. Uh, moving on, we've got some common issues, fluid capacities, uh, tire information, lifting points, reset procedures, whether it's uh, the TPMS or, or oil life monitor, one of these kind of systems, DTC index, of course, wiring diagrams, uh, component locations, component tests, and finally the actual service manual itself. Now, as far as the service information goes, I can use the tab at the top left to access an estimate guide, stored quotes, maintenance information, and the service manual. Now, I can also act, access the Short Tracks community. Now, this is a place where I can uh, use the assistance or get the assistance of other technicians, or I can provide help to other technicians in the Sure Track community. So that's something that's another nice feature of this particular service information system. All right. Now, I also want to kind of look, because we're going to be playing with the wiring diagram for our Scion, I want to kind of take a look at that and show you some of the things that I really like about using Mitchell for their wiring diagrams. So let's type in something more generic uh, in the beginning here. Let's take a look at, oh, I don't know. Let's try uh, something I haven't tried yet. Crankshaft position sensor. Say I've got a crankshaft position sensor code and I wanna look at the wiring diagram related to it. So we put that in the search term to get the search results, crankshaft position sensor, and then we get all of this information related to it, which is really nice. Real fixes, let's take a look at that. Okay, you get some real fixes. Here are several that have been done. Has it fixed the car? And I wanna stress here that these are not silver bullets, but it is information that can help you when you're planning your own diagnostic flow. Uh, top repairs, this gives you a graph of those repairs over mileage. Okay, we can see here that the gold replaced the crankshaft position sensor, and you see that most of that occurred oh, around 75,000 miles. Um, causes and fixes, fixes kind of just shows it in a little different format. Here's what like the symptoms were, and then a line drawn to what resulted into that, that problem. Again, this is all information that you can use in formulating your diagnostic flow. Not silver bullets. You still have to do your own testing to verify that you too have the same cause, but this will help you gain a lot of that information. And there's more here. I mean, we've got uh, guided component testing, Component location, operation, this is theory and operation. Always want to check that as we'll, as we'll do with our uh, sunroof. But like I said, the main thing I want to start here is show you an example of the wiring diagram. So we're going to pull up a wiring diagram and I want to see it in regular size. So we're just going to click on that and we'll get it down to regular size. And what I want you to notice here is that we already have some wiring highlighted. Now to make it easier to see, I'm going to use this function to hide the wires that are not highlighted. It'll kind of take them out as you can see here. Makes it even more clear. But let's kind of zoom in and pardon me for uh, having to move the diagram around if we have to. But yeah, see that? It's already showing and already highlighted the crankshaft position sensor for us. So it's part of that search result. And we can follow it 
using the highlighted wiring. Now this is all contained on one page, yet the engine performance circuit is actually four pages long. Now, how many times have you guys had to go from page to page to page tracing a circuit for a different component, you know, for a given component? Well, let me show that to you too. We're gonna back out with that for a minute. How about let's put in um, ignition. We'll do ignition coil. Click on that, do the same thing. We're gonna go all the way to the wiring diagrams, break it down to the small one so we can see it nice and easy. Same thing, you can see all of the uh, coils are highlighted. All the wiring is highlighted. Let's hit that hide view. And you can see a couple of spots where they go off the page. But if I wanna trace where these wires are going off the page, I would have to like look up the little number and then you know kind of remember that number and then go over the page. But this is really nice because if I just click on the next page, you can see where that's carried over for me already. The highlighting is continued. So I don't have to do that. More so if let's just say that I have a question about this this relay. If I want to see what's going to affect that relay, I can click on it. And now that's adding in the wiring related to that relay. Then one last thing I want to show you, and then we'll start tackling this ion. And you can see that the relay is named. This is the IG2 relay. Here's the IG2 fuse. And then this is located in the engine room junction block. But notice that these are all in blue. Well, that's a hyperlink, so if I click on that, I'm gonna get all of this related information over here. Now, if I see engine room junction block, I'm gonna get the information on the junction block. And then when I'm done with that, I can come right back to where I was on the diagram. So that saves a lot of opening a window and then going to another window and having to backtrack to open the window you had originally. If you've ever dealt with that before, you know what a pain in the butt that was. So these are some of the things that I like about ProDemand, and we're gonna use those features to help us with this sunroof. So let's get to that. Let's clear that, and we're gonna put in sunroof. And then we'll pick the sunroof here. And now, the first thing I want to know about the sunroof is I have to know how it operates. So let's go to component operation and see what that tells us. Well, we've got a few things here. Sliding roof does not move by operating the sliding roof control switch. And this is showing me this is for the model year starting 01, 2014 and on. Here one does not move by operating the sliding roof control switch. And this is for an earlier model, 05, a build date of 05, 2013 through 01 2014. So this is the early part of the model year here. This is the second part of the model year here. System description. That's really what I'm interested in. So let's see what it says here about how this one is supposed to function. It has the following functions, a manual open and close, an auto open, jam protection, and key off operation. What are the main components? Well, we have a sliding roof drive gear subassembly, also referred to as a sliding roof ECU. So this ECU is controlling the rotational direction of the motor. So in other words, I know right now that the switches on the overhead panel that operate the sunroof are not directly wired to the motor. It's going to an ECU and then the ECU is gonna tell the motor which way to go. So that kind of leads into the next one here, the sliding roof switch outputs operation signals to the ECU. So this is really an input to the ECU, uh, the computer in charge of the sliding roof motor. And then we have a description here of the different features, uh, how the manual open is supposed to work, how the manual close, auto open, 
but I'm thinking about the symptom that I have. Okay, sometimes the, the window just won't open. So that's kind of like the manual or auto open function. Neither, obviously, neither one is working. And the only different, different um, difference between the two is how long you hold the switch for. So if I just tap the switch, it's going to open and then stop as soon as I take my finger off. If I hold the switch for more than a few tenths of a second, then it's going to go through the fully open automatically. But again, mine's not, not working. Sometimes. Um, so we have a, also we have a sliding roof open warning. So if the ignition switch is on and then turned off and the driver's door is open but the sliding roof is also still open, there's going to be a buzzer in the instrument panel and the combination meter assembly to let the driver know that, hey, you're, you're getting out of the car and you left the sunroof open. All right, so now I have a basic understanding, excuse me, of how the sunroof is going to function. Now let's take a look at the schematic. Again, these are just very, very simplified diagrams. Might give us a little clue here what's going on. Uh, we'll take the early build date just to get an idea. Okay, we see we have the map light assembly. We have two switch contacts, one for up, one for down, or one for close, one for open. And all that's going to do is when it's grounded, it's going to pull that, that signal to ground. And that's what the sliding roof ECU is going to see. And then it's going to operate the sliding roof motor. And these two uh, Hall effect chips are, are, I'm guessing these are positioned to let the ECU knows, know where the, uh, the window is. Now, I'm not going to swear to this, but... I'm thinking that this might be a brush type motor. I don't know. Um, I don't see anything in the information about what type of motor it uses, but just kind of looking at this symbol, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a brush type motor. That could be a reason for the problem I'm having, and I'll explain that as we go along. All right, so let's get out of that. I want to see something more. Now, when we're Looking at a schematic, and we're trying to understand how the circuit functions, we have to remember what a basic circuit needs. So first and foremost, we have to have a source. We have to have some something that's going to supply the electrical energy to operate the system. And on a car, I always reference the battery. Now you'll notice in the diagram, there's no battery shown. That's because it only goes up as far as the fuse. But typically these diagrams are laid up so that the route to the positive side of the battery is on the upper half of the diagram and the route to the negative side of the battery is toward the bottom of the diagram, typically. Also, uh, if you really want to trace it all the way back to the battery, you can use what's called the power distribution diagram locate the fuses or whatever you've identified uh, as the stopping point on your block diagram here and then follow that back to the battery. Okay, but for me, I'm, I'm going to be satisfied once I identify where the power is coming from and where the ground points are for that part of my schematic or circuit. So that gives me the source, that gives me the path, but there's no reason to have a circuit unless there's some work to be done. What's the work that's supposed to be done here? Well, I've got to move that sunroof open and closed. And what's going to do that? The motor is. And here's the motor here. And as we're already aware, that motor is part of the sliding roof ECU. So it's one component. We know that the ECU, based on our uh, reading of the component operation, it's going to receive signals from this switch. So it knows what the driver wants to do. Now, as I said, we have to have a source. That's the battery. We have to have a path between the load and the battery. But we also have to have some way to control it. Well, 
the control device is actually the ECU or that part of the ECU that's turning the motor uh, on and off and which in which direction, whether it's sending polarity positive, negative, or negative and positive uh, to make the motor turn in the right direction. The switch here you would think is a control device, but it's really not. It is an input to the ECU so that the ECU, ECU knows what to do. What else do we need in a circuit? If you watch my videos in the past, you know that we also need a circuit protection device. Well, it's going to be up here in the fuses. So it can be a fuse, nine times out of ten, fusible link, circuit breaker. You see that on some, some of the really older cars. <laughs> but uh, again, that's we also need to have that in our circuit. So let's see if we can trace it and see what, what's going on. I always start at the load. Remember what we said earlier about one of the features? If I want to uh, find out where the wiring for the load goes, all I have to do is click on it. Now everything is highlighted. I'm going to use the hidden function to hide everything else on the diagram that I'm really not interested in at the moment. And then we're going to work our way down. The first wire I come to is labeled B. It's a pink wire. And we're just going to follow that back up here to the fuse. Now notice this is a 30 amp fuse. That's pretty substantial. And it's labeled for the sunroof. Any bets on whether or not this is the power supply that the ECU is going to use for the motor? I think it is. And then we also, next wire is uh, going here to a splice pack. It's internal to the instrument panel junction block, as we can see here. And if we want to know where the rest of the connections go, I'm just going to see if I can highlight them this way. Yep, and then we'll highlight the next one. And right away, you can see that this third one that we highlighted, that's, that goes right to ground. And it's located at the left kick panel. All right. So this is a ground. Since it's right next to the power supply for the motor, I'm going to assume that it's the power uh, ground point for the motor as well. Now keep in mind the ECU, while we said it earlier it's a control device, it's also a load on its own, right? Because it has to have power and ground to function. So it has to have its own power and ground source. Now I'm going to kind of skip a little head a little bit because you notice right next to this fuse is another fuse. That's coming, of course, to the ECU. So I'm guessing that's the power source for the ECU. All right, so far we've identified the power to the load, ground to the load. Now we have to see what's going to make the ECU work. We've got power. There's no separate ground feed, so I'm assuming it's going to share this ground. And then we have this red wire. Let's follow that. Okay, that's coming up in here to this main body ECU. And you can see that it's on a LIN bus. So this is a communications line. And because the main body ECU also has CAN connected to it, this is also the gateway module. This is the one that's going to allow these signals to be translated and shared. Now what does that have to do with anything? Well remember the, the, the safety feature that lets the driver know that you left the window open well, that's over here in the combi meter, the instrument cluster. We'll just highlight that for a moment. And you can see that we have power coming in. It's connected to the computer data, data lines, just as we have here at the CAN network going into the ECU. It's grounded. And we have this door switch that's providing an input to the main body ECU. So in the case of the... the Leaving the sliding roof open, the sliding roof ECU is going to be able to tell the main body ECU whether that window is open or closed. 
this switch is also going to tell the ECU whether or not the driver's door is open or closed. And then it's going to be able to use these data lines to transmit that information to the instrument panel, the instrument cluster, and turn the buzzer on. All right, so we'll get rid of those. We have two more wires on the ECU to look at. We trace those down and we see that they are connected to the switch located in the map light assembly. One is for close, one is for open. And when that switch contact is closed, it's going to connect that output to ground through that junction block. And that's going to let the ECU know that the button has been pushed and it's going to operate the motor accordingly. So I think we've identified everything that we need to in the circuit. We have our load, we have our source, we have a path between the two, uh, we have our control devices, and we also have our circuit protection. So we have all the elements that a basic circuit needs. Uh, now we're ready to go and take what we've learned and apply it to our situation. So based on what we know about this circuit, what do you think could be a reason why the window will only will not open sometimes intermittently well we could have some problem with the input right maybe the the contacts are burnt or loose or or whatever the case might be it's or uh, corroded there could be uh, who knows maybe there's some type of voltage drop issue across the contacts because when it comes to an input to an ECU, ECUs, keep in mind, they operate on ones and zeros, yeses and nos, ons and offs. They don't work real well to maybe off. So if I'm going to say I have a 12 put input signal on that line and I close the switch, the idea is to bring it all the way down to ground, all the way down to zero. And then the ECU knows. When I see that number, when I see that, that voltage level, then I know the switch is closed. If there's something that does not allow it to do that, and it provides um, an incomplete drop to zero, maybe let's say it goes to five volts, then the ECU may go, what? I don't know. What does that mean? And it's not going to do anything at all. So that could be part of it. Could there be a problem in the ECU itself? Sure. Because it's a 2014, it's uh, going on a seven-year-old car. And there's a lot of vibration and bumping and jarring. Who knows what could have, what happened in here. So this is possible. How about the motor itself? Well, if it is a brush-type motor, then absolutely. How many times have you seen, say, like a starter, that it gets set in one certain position and it doesn't, it won't turn? Back in the old days, you get a little wrap on the case with a, with a dead blow, and, and then all of a sudden now it works again. Now, don't do that anymore, because a lot of these motors are brushless, and you'll just ruin that motor. So don't do that. So I'm thinking these are probably the most likely areas. All right, so we have the information here. Now it's time to design some tests and, and get to work. Now, again, going back to the schematic, there are only three things that could cause the sunroof to not operate. That's the switch, the sunroof motor, or the sunroof motor ECU. Now these last two are one assembly, so it doesn't really matter which one fails, I'll have to replace it if that's the cause as an assembly anyway. Now the other thing to consider is that the switch is not really a switch, it's an input to the ECU. And while I can test that easily enough with my voltmeter, it may not be fast enough to catch any dropouts in the signal that could be causing my customer's problem. So what do you say we use a scope instead? To set my scope up for the test, I'm gonna start off by putting one channel to each side of the switch. The green wire is the feed side for the open command and a tan wire is the side for the closed command. So we'll put channels one and two on those two wires. Now with the key on, I expect to see voltage, probably 12 volts at the signal. 
and when I operate the switch, I expect it to be pulled to ground, and it should be a nice clean pull to ground. Now it's one thing to know if the switches are working the way they should or not. What we also need to know is, is the ECU operating the motor based on the input it's getting from the switch? Well, we could go to the motor itself and take some measurements there, but it's not the easiest component to get to, and I don't like doing difficult if I don't have to. If you remember the schematic, though, we did see that there's a 30 amp fuse that supplies the power to the motor. So what if we check current there? I mean, current's the same anywhere in the circuit, so we can go wherever it's easy, and that's certainly an easy spot to access. So we're gonna measure the current on another channel on our scope, and then we're gonna operate the system, see what kind of test results we get. Okay, this first screenshot is of the um, system working. Uh, just a reminder, the red and blue, the first two channels are connected to the switch. And then I have a current clamp at the fuse to see if the starter motor actually engages and, and they get a feel for how much current it's, it's drawing. Uh, as you can see here, it appears to be working just fine, both open and closed. Uh, we haven't caught the glitch quite yet. Um, so I'm thinking this is probably normal operation. Uh, the amperage range for the motor is not out of range for what I would expect from a uh, component that's fused by a 30 amp fuse. Um, the switches uh, are pulling the ground, looks nice and clean. Uh, that little section at the end where you can see um, several openings and closings. In other words, I'm just pressing the button and uh, letting the window open and close a little at a time, you know, just to check that function, see if I can get something to mess up. Same with the, the close function. And so far, we haven't captured what we're looking for. Now, one of the nice things about the scope is that I can zoom in on sections of it to get a closer look of what, what's going on. So I did that on the current ramp for the motor. Now, remember I said I wasn't sure if this was a brush type or a brushless motor. Well, I'm kind of still leaning towards a brush type motor, mainly because you can see the sawtooth pattern in the current ramp similar to what you would see in a starter motor or a, a fuel pump. Um, and when I look closer at the pattern, um, I'm not paying much attention to the, to the wave as much as I am the individual peaks. And there seem to be a few in there that maybe aren't as clean as they should be. Could that be indicative of where my problem lies? So I'm continuing to operate the switch, and then I see this. Uh, you can see where I'm opening or trying to open the window several times with the switch, and I see nothing on the current pattern. I can hear a click coming from the sliding roof ECU, which, if you recall, contains the motor. So I'm pretty confident that the switch inputs are getting to the ECU, but the ECU is not carrying out the order or the motor isn't, uh, is stuck maybe, or uh, may, if it is a brush type motor, we've seen where there's points of wear for if it lands just right, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Uh, whatever the case might be, since it's a uh, component that only comes as a assembly, I'm gonna go ahead and I think I'm gonna to have to replace this, this part. Looking at a sliding roof ECU. Let's recap a few things that we learned today. Number one, whatever troubleshooting challenge you're going to undertake, you have to have a solid foundation before you can take on that, that challenge. Especially when it comes to electrical troubleshooting, you must have a good understanding of how electricity works, how circuits work, before you can take on those challenges successfully. Number two, do your homework. Take the time to make sure you understand how the system you're going to be troubleshooting operates before you even open the hood or a car door. Um, if there's a schematic involved, make sure you take the time to review and analyze that as well. If you take the time to do the homework, you'll find the time spent on the car a lot less and your diagnostic efficiency a lot more. We'll see you next month.
Thank you.